أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين أبي القاسم محمد المصطفى صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين الغر الميمين المظلومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My beloved uh, brothers and sisters, respected viewers, I am Ali Burji and inshallah I'll be the host of this brand new show uh, on Imam Hussein TV called T3, Teach, Talk and Thrive inshallah. And with us we'll have uh, for the entire Shah Ramadan inshallah, Sayyid Shabir Karmani from the United States. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, you Sayyidina? Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. I'm honored to be here with you as well. I'm honored to be here with you, to be honest. And um, inshallah, we just wanted to remind our viewers, for any of you who haven't um, been with us yesterday, which was the first uh, episode, uh, we started the topic of activism and development during mm. the holy month of uh, Ramadan. And inshallah, we'll continue. Um, also, would like to uh, inform you all that uh, during the second half of our program, we're going to have the lines open for any of you who would like to join us, whether to um, ask a question or if you would like to contribute to our conversations and our topic. And the number will be available for you at the lower uh, bottom of your screens. Uh, inshallah, we'd like to uh, begin by just... Um, roughly uh, kind of reminding our audience of um, our topic which was discussed yesterday regarding development mm. uh, and during the holy month and mm. development in general but I, I know you wanted to focus today on the economic development mm. in our communities mm. and uh, inshallah just a few words with regards to uh, development and mm. activism and how our communities can uh, benefit and improve upon it, inshallah. Bismillah. So it's a very good question, a very important question. Um, in terms of development, the idea being how do I create a society that is thriving? And that's really a part of our show, right? How do we thrive as individuals and as communities at, as large? How do we uplift each other together, hand in hand? And we said that the first component is we first, and Shahr Ramadan brings that beautiful opportunity to develop, to develop ourselves, first and foremost. And once we develop ourselves, we can start to help others as well in that process. The world is changed one person at a time. Now, that doesn't mean that I just wait for myself to become perfect and then start trying to help others. No. That means that I start on the journey and I may be a little bit ahead of others in the journey and maybe I, I, I hold their hand. Or vice versa, we go hand in hand and help each other. I mean, in terms of, it's a continuous journey. But when we talk about development, we talk about how to have strong, for example, masajid, how to have strong Husseiniyat, how to have a strong Islamic centers, for example. No, let's think even bigger, for example. How do I have a strong community within my city and furthermore within my country? And then further, even at a global level, how do we create this strong infrastructure? Well, one of the components that you need, you need several components, but one of the components that we need is economic strength and development. And if we go back to the history of Islam, we saw these components when Islam was being developed in its initial phases. That Rasulullah the Holy Prophet himself, he brought this mission and he put it forward to the world. But he first established his character to such a level that no one could deny it. That Rasulullah, as our respected viewers know and you are aware as well, he stood by the mountain and he said, if I told you there was an army behind this mountain, would you believe me? And everyone said that we have never known you to be dishonest, that we would believe you, absolutely, that he had established himself as Sadiq and Amin. Is that one of the wisdoms of Allah, why he um, waited 40 years before he proclaimed his prophethood, that he established that etiquette in the society, so he was well known before he uh, propagated the message. Subhanallah, beautiful. So the, he had established such a character at such a level and it took time to, and people knew that this man was a man of integrity. This was a man of honesty. That he was sadiq, he was honest, and I mean trustworthy. That people could leave their trust with him, they know he wouldn't cheat him. I want to go back for a moment to the moment and the early part of Rasulullah's life. That when he was young, he was orphaned as a youth. 
this Shah Ramadan brings another opportunity to not forget about the orphans in this time, for example. Rasulullah himself was an orphan from a young age, going from family to family, relative to relative. You know, for example, first his grandfather, then to his uncle Abu Talib. But he got to an age where he was in his, uh, his adolescence, if you will say, you know, 12, 13 years old. He began to go with his uncle on trade journeys with Abu Talib. When he began to go, subhanallah, there are many aspects and many dimensions of this journey. But what I want to focus on was Rasulullah was someone who was a very, very good businessman, in particular a salesman. You may think, you know, there's a stigma in the modern world attached to, for example, sales, some people may say. Yes. But Amir, the amazing thing about this person, and I will tie this in with Amir al-Mu'mineen eventually, that when Rasulullah would go and do business, people wanted to do business with him more. Subhanallah. What kind of... What kind of business was Rasulullah doing? What kind of ethics was he bringing to the business platform that may have not been there before? That's a beautiful um, topic which inshallah we'd like to expand further. Because it's, it's, I think it's, it's an issue within our society as well, how to distinguish good from wrong, halal from haram. It's quite a thin line. Mm. And especially in the world of business, as you said, being a salesman. Mm. There's a taboo mm. nowadays being a salesman because mm. At the end of the day, you need to, it's like selling dreams. Mm. You need to um, take something, wrap it up, make it look like gold, so you can eventually sell it. Mm. And I put forth the question, and subhanAllah, there's a wisdom to why the Holy Prophet was a businessman himself. So we can learn from that, that the Holy Prophet himself was a businessman. So how could he have been a successful businessman without deceiving, without lying? Selling something for what it is, mm. and it is known that, for example, if if he was in in in, in the um, in the trade area or the marketplace, yeah, um, if if for example he knew that uh, the merchant next to him had a better product, he would tell the people, the customers, to go to the merchant next to him. Now I ask you, who would do that nowadays? Wow. Who would tell a, a merchant? Oh, sorry, next door is something better than I have. Mm. Rarely you'll see mm. that. Mm. And that's the beautiful thing that we need to ponder and reflect on it. Absolutely. So it's very crucial, it's very important. Very well said. And so to tie into that point, as Rasulullah's time progressed, as he became older and he continued to do business and do even better in business, he, be he developed a reputation for being someone who is honest and genuine and yet very effective at what they do. And to the point that they would say that he would go to his trade journeys, he would come back with three times the profit of anyone else. SubhanAllah. Yet everyone said they wanted to do business with him again. SubhanAllah. Rasulullah is telling us a very valuable lesson here. That business and enterprising is about relationships at the end of the day. Business is always about good relationships. And when you're honest with people, over time people will recognize this. And you'll, they'll say you'll develop a reputation that this is a person who is honest, genuine, and sincere. And people will find you rather than you having to go find them. Mm. You know, today in sales, people pick up the phone, do cold calls, for example. When you develop a strong relationship, people will find you. To the point that as time further progressed, and we come towards the time where Rasul Adam was beginning to get married, and the proposal was brought forth to him, it was very interesting that his, his, his representation and his, you know, people knowing him for his sincerity in business and honesty, this led him to be known and recognized and give, getting him a proposal. You know, if we think about it from that standpoint, that this person was so honest, so, so genuine, so sincere, and so good at what he did, he had this reputation that preceded him before he even came into the room. And, and as you know, he was married with the blessed... The mother of Fatimah al Zahra, Lady Khadija, alayha, who was someone who was the wealthiest person in Arabia, very well off. And they had this blessed marriage, and she admired the integrity of Rasulullah. And they had this beautiful relationship. You know, these, these people were, were, were divine representatives, role models for us. Of course, Rasulullah was picked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by God Almighty Himself. But these were role models for us, in particular, for example, Lady Khadija. That you can be honest and sincere and pious and still be successful in a worldly sense. There's no problem. 
You know, Some may come and ask you, how? How, Sayyidina? Oh, son, beautiful. Islam gives us the tools to be successful in both worlds. Yes, that means that one may struggle in this world. There may be challenges, there may be tests, there may be trials, no doubt about it. But that doesn't mean that you have to fail in this life. One can be very successful in this life. Because Islam, you want to use this life, this world that we're given, as a means to make better in that life, Ahsan. in the hereafter. But if someone can't conquer this world, how are we going to conquer the everlasting world? That we are told in numerous times that we are not supposed to be like monks in Islam that are in hiding, for example. Mm. Not to say anything against monks, but to say that, for example, we should not be in isolation away from the rest of the world and just pray. This has not been accepted by Islam. And we have numerous traditions backing this up. We as Muslims are supposed to live in the modern world and thrive in the modern world and every world behind it. We're supposed to thrive in every era, whether that be economically, whether that be academically, whether that be personally in our personal lives or in worship indeed. These are very important. But going back to Lady Khadija, this person was the wealthiest of her time. You know, to be like, I think just this past weekend, there was a very famous wedding that happened in the city, not too far away. Oh, did a it? royal one, they were told. Indeed. And she was the most royal of her time. Yet imagine this person to go from such a status of worldly material level. It was for, what is it? Not for her wealth. The Mus Islam is indebted to Lady Khadija. Tremendously. It is indebted to Lady Khadija. It is indebted to Abu Talib. Abu Talib who protected Rasulullah and his mission in those early days. That Rasulullah himself says that after Abu Talib, the difficulties and calamities befell on me at the highest level. And as you know, that year that Rasulullah called Amul Huzn, where he lost the year of sorrow, the year of grief, where he lost his two most beloved people. And his life was traumatic for him. It was very difficult for him. But Lady Khadija, this this princess, if I may use the word in that time, the royal, in a sense, she gave up everything for Islam. To the point that we're told Rasulullah did not even have a kafan for her, a shroud. Imagine, this is the level of sacrifice. So this lays a principle for us, fundamentally, that you and I, as people who are enterprising, whether that's someone working in their professional career, whether that's someone who's doing business, that person must work very hard and struggle within the bounds of Islam to ethically move forward in their enterprise and their business. They must, however, raise their level of giving in that process and not stop. And this is what the Ahlul Bayt tell us, that give as much as you can. Had it not been for Lady Khadija, Islam would not have been give able to... Give as in which sense? As in, in charity? In terms of her establishing and her supporting the Muslims. As you know, the Quraysh had put economic sanctions mm. on the Muslims. And these economic sanctions were stifling. You know, today, till this, till this day, economic sanctions exist in the world. People put economic sanctions on countries and communities to stifle them. And they can be very difficult for the people. And the same was done on the Muslims. When economic sanctions were placed on the Muslims, it was Lady Khadija who helped support Islam and give it strength in that time and help them survive. You need economically thriving people in order to build a strong community. But economically thriving in what sense? In Islam, the means matter just as much as the ends. Ahsan. We, don't, we do not neglect the means because the ends is good. I can't say that I have a goal of building a beautiful mosque, a beautiful masjid, a beautiful Husayniya, but you know, I'm going to do something illegal, something haram, in order to get some money and then do this. This is not acceptable. Mm. The means are just as, port, as important as the ends. And we need to be very mindful in the same way. This is what Lady Khadija and the others admired about Rasulullah. That he said that just to make a quick, a quick dollar, a quick pound, a quick dirham, I will not cheat anyone ever. And this is the way the Ahlul Bayt operated. There's a beautiful saying that we use in the West. It's called, don't be penny wise and pound foolish. This idea that you try to make a quick small amount of money, but you cheat someone. You're wise on the penny, you're sly, you're slick on the small penny. Mm. But you miss the big picture and you don't make the pound or the dollar which is worth more. How do you do that? 
Do you do that by being honest and just and, in, and being fair and equitable? And w how important is tawakkul in this formula? Tremendously. Trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, tawakkul ala Allah is a very important component to this, absolutely. Because one may say, you know, you're in a business dealing with someone, for example, and you may think to yourself that, you know, I know I have the upper hand on, in leverage in this negotiation. I can probably stifle this person after extra, out of extra hundred thousand dollars, for example. You know you have that ability. But what does your trust in Allah tell you? My trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should tell me that if I work hard and honestly, that money will come to me. In its own way, in its, in, its, in its own due time, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has determined it. And if it's not to come to me, then why shall I take from someone else? This world is not a zero-sum game, for example. There's enough for everyone out there. Islam encourages us to use our intellect. I sometimes wonder, Brother Ali, why does Allah encourage us and Islam encourages us to do tafakkur and tadabbur so often? Reflection, contemplation. The tafakkur as sa'a. It is the one hour of reflection is better than 70 years of worship, Ascent. for example. Why? We are to sharpen our minds. A Muslim must always be sharp in their intellect. Because it's not all about just shallow worship. It needs Ascent. to have depth. Depth must be there. And who better than Ahlul Bayt salam, who showed it through the practice and teachings and Ascent. things. So when I come into enterprising, I can, I can try to cheat and swindle and steal someone, but I may be thinking at a very low level. However, if I try to use my intellect and I do tawakkul to Allah, Ya Allah, and to the Ahlul Bayt salam, that help me in this situation. I want to mm. do an honest day's wage. I want to do an honest day's labor. I want to earn honestly. And if something is not for you, it's not meant for you, it won't find you. It's also very important for us to understand and within brackets, read the signs. For example, something if you really want it and you strive towards it, but you're not getting there, yeah. that means it's, maybe it's not best for you. Either it's not best for you mm. or it's not best for you right now. It might mm. be better, good for you later. Ahsan. And that's something that a lot of people may be lacking, that they're not reading the signs. Mm. And it's a beautiful point that later, this, this is a key word that you said. And this is where I would like to come into the, maybe perhaps we can talk about how, why is it important to have, to thrive economically in this day and in all eras, for example. Why is this important? Well, we have masajid, we have husayniyat, we have institutions, we have media facilities. All of these require economic funding. Who does this funding? This funding predominantly is done by those who are enterprising. For example, we need to get to a point where we have recurring revenue, for example, generating on a month-to-month -month basis, mm -hmm. where we're not always having to do fundraising, for example. Alhamdulillah, some people have begun on this work and it's, they're doing great work. But we need to expand the horizons. Those who are in business, for example, today, must further thrive on that regard. Now, a very important question that the viewer may ask is, well, why business? Why are you emphasizing business? Why not work? This is a very important question. And I'd like to say there are numerous traditions. For example, if you look at Usul al-Kafi, one of our most authentic uh, books of Hadith, you know, our, our, our main four, four books, or Kutub al-Arba, that are the most authentic books of it, we have these books in, for example, Man la yahdaru al-Faqi, Tahzeeb, Istibsar, being the other books, for example. But if you go to Usul al-Kafi, in Usul al-Kafi, one of the volumes that you'll find is an entire bab or, or door or volume on economics. In that, you will find how much emphasis Islam has placed on business. We have numerous traditions in this regard. For example, there's a moment in time where a man comes to Imam Sadiq salam, and he comes to him and he says uh, to the Imam, Ya ibn Rasulillah, or son of the Grand Prophet, of the Prophet, grandson of the Holy Prophet, that many of the Shia are becoming employed. They're working for people. So, Alhamdulillah, it's good. It's, it's very important to earn halal or halal livelihood. And times are different, times change from time to time. But he makes a very important point. Imam Sa'ad Ali Salam says, tell them to, if they can do business, it is better for them. Encourage them to do business. For whoever, whoever becomes employed, and I speak as someone who has been employed for the predominant part of my life, for the, the, the Imam Ali Salam says, for anyone who becomes employed, they limit their sustenance, their risk. 
Subhanallah, a, a very big statement that's being said yeah. here. But why? That when I endeavor in business, it goes back to exactly what you said, tawakkul. Tawakkul ala Allah. Trust in Allah that Allah, if I do my hard work, Allah will provide. There's no doubt about it. Sometimes, when you're employed, sometimes you get very comfortable. For example, I know my check is guaranteed. That at the end of the month or every second week or whatever, that is definitely going to come. Some may argue that even today you never know about that as well. So the economic uncertainty in the world. And that's a fair point as well. But it may make you complacent. Whereas when you know that I am on my own, I have a team to support me. But I need that one, the ultimate sustainer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help me. Then that trust, that relationship becomes stronger or should become stronger if it's not. Mm. So that's very important. So Imam Ali Musalam says that. Second point. There's a hadith that you'll find there as well that says there are 10 parts to risk, 10 parts to sustenance, to your income. Nine of those 10 are in tijara, in business, in trading. Wow. SubhanAllah. 10 parts, 90% of it is in the business. Isn't that true in today's world? What are we hearing in the world today? The 99% and the 1%. That when you, in America, this is a very, very, very open discussion and dialogue. I'm sure it's the same here. That the resources of the world and the country are controlled by 1% of the population. The majority of the income mm. is controlled by... And who are all those people? Are they just, are they doctors or dentists? or Although with due respect, and we need these people, they're business. They're people who are endeavoring and enterprising in business. That's what they are. That's what, that's what the reality of the matter is. This is the hadith that is coming from Ahlul Bayt salam that is telling us. Ten parts of sustenance. There's another very interesting hadith that says there's ten parts to intellect. Nine of those ten are in business. In tijara. This one was, had me perplexed. I was always wondering, what does this mean? This is very strange. Yeah, please elaborate. Because I would think that somebody who is a businessman versus someone, maybe an academic is someone who should be. The fundamental nature of being a successful business person, whether a male or female, to excel in business, you need to be a good problem solver. Mm. That's the essence of business. Awesome. You know, you talk about mathematics. Sure. In America, the people who graduate with a PhD in physics, there's two fields they go into more than any other field. Number one, they go to NASA. For, as you can imagine, a physicist, an astrophysicist, for example, they would be doing calculations for, example, rocket science, right? So that makes sense. The second place where they go is what's called Wall Street. We're going to banking. Now, we may disagree about Wall Street and how the means and ends argument might come up again. But the question I want to ask is a little different. Why is Wall Street, why is investment banking, why are they so keen and why are they so interested in having PhD physicists? Why? Because they know they are very good problem solvers and they have to solve problems every day. Mm. That can be mathematical or otherwise. I, as someone who's enterprising, I am very sure that Rasulullah, although he had divine, divine inspiration, the people he was mentoring, the people around him, when he was telling them to do honest business, perhaps they had to use their mind a little bit more creatively in order to succeed and excel because the person next door or around them, maybe somebody else was cheating and not being fair. And so they were getting a quick dollar. So maybe they had to be a little bit more creative in the way that they thought. But don't, don't despise and don't, don't ever have despair in the Rahmah of Allah. That same Rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the ability to give you and I tremendous intellect. You know, there are numerous, there's numerous scholars of ours, I, I don't want to take all the names, there's so many, who say in Najaf al-Ashraf, that when they asked, where did they get the ability to write these phenomenal books? Where did they get the ability, for example, to be such scholars, to do such jurisprudential rulings and brings forth such evolution in fiqh, for example? They would always point to the haram of Amir al-Mu'min, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. And they say, it was nothing other than this man. That whenever I wanted to succeed, I would, I would pray to raka'a salah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the presence and vicinity of the shrine. And I would say, Ya Allah, by this amazing intellect, by the door of the city of knowledge, Bab al Ali ibn Abi Talib, Allah grant me and expand my intellect. And don't be surprised if Allah expands your intellect in that regard. Islam is heavily emphasized, one, to be 
an entrepreneur to be a businessman and a businesswoman, as Lady Khadija, for example, gives us a very clear indication of this. Now, does it mean that it's haram to be employed? Of course not. There's many examples, for example, at times they were employed. For example, Musa alayhi salam was Realistically, employed. we can't all be self-employed either. Exactly. That's exactly right. This may not be for everyone. Yeah. There are times where Amir al-Mu'mineen himself was employed. He would dig ditches for people, for example, at a wage. This was employment. Mm. But I want to come further, and maybe we'll talk about Amir al-Mu'mineen later down the line, about how his evolution in his professional life occurred. Inshallah, when we get closer to his martyrdom as well, Inshallah. that'll be perfect. Inshallah, we'd love to talk about that as well, as well. Now, with regards to the economic development, how important is development, but even more economic development? So it's very, it's extremely important to focus on this. As I mentioned to you the previous day, we mentioned yesterday, that Islam, as, as per Rasulullah, tells us to divide our awake day into three portions. And we said one is between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one, one is between us and our friends and close relatives and our family, and then one is to seek out a halal sustenance and a halal, halal livelihood. When we look towards enterprising and economic development, well, how do we sustain and help strengthen our community around us? I want to share a story of a brother of uh, a story that a brother shared with me after one of my lectures. I was um, I was in the states at one point in time, and this was this interestingly a very similar incident happened in the Europe and in the states after one of my lectures on economic development. The brother comes up to me after the lecture and he says, "Say, I was very intrigued by your discussion on economic development." To the point that I wanted to share something with you. I said, please share with me. He said, he said, I left Iraq at a young age because of the circumstances there, and I ended up in Europe. He said, when I ended up in Europe first, I had a very difficult time getting about. I was very well qualified back home. I believe he was an engineer, very well educated, very smart man. But of course, sometimes those credentials don't transfer over, whatever it may be. He said, my first job that I got in Europe was as a salesman, a procurement officer actually. My job was actually to get supplies for a particular convenience, a store. And uh, this was my job. So I would have to negotiate day in and day out and make sure I got the best deals for my employer so that we could then sell those products to the customers. So he said that I, did I worked very hard at that and I tried to negotiate better than anyone else. And I tried to be the best that I, that I could be at that. So I would negotiate to the point that I would get the best price for my employer. Question, how can I ensure that if I'm engaged in this sort of um, work, for example, negotiating mm. to get the best deal possible, mm. how can I ensure because th that, that negotiation process is maintained within the halal means? Mm. How can I ensure that what's the guideline, mm. the compass? Mm. Because um, unfortunately, Business nowadays is mostly built on a platform mm. which promotes unjustness. Because, mm. for example, you mentioned Wall Street. Mm. Now, a lot of people would put a question mark whether I can earn halal earning from Wall Street. Mm. I don't know. Mm. But is what's the compass to ensure that I can negotiate or I can be part of this? Um, platform, but ensure that I've not, I've not fallen mm. in, in, the, in, the, in the trick or I haven't fallen in this trap and start earning haram without even realizing. Well, I'll tell you, you know, like when I did my undergrad, I studied economics in, in my bachelor, economics, math and computer science. And some of my initial offers were from some of the biggest investment banks in the world. And I personally felt that there was too much red tape in that area for me to navigate. And so I didn't feel that was the best decision for me at the time. And so I tried to dodge that. Someone else may, may feel differently. However, there is very, it's very important to note where you get your risk from is very important. There's no doubt about this. We need to be very mindful to the point that many of our scholars have said that, that what you eat and what goes into your stomach can have a big impact on who you become. Of course. To this extent that... that Aba Abdullah al Hussein, Imam al Hussein Ali Abdullah Salatu was salam, when he was the day before Ashura or, the, or the, his ceremony before the Battle of Karbala, he addressed the one where he's on the camel, he addressed the people, the army of Yazid, he addressed them. 
And he told them, do you not know who I am? Do you know, not know my position to Rasulullah? Do you not know my family? Do you not know what, what is my position? Do you not know who I am? They all knew. But he got on, he got down, he looked at Abu Fadl, he looked at, he said, let's go. They will not listen to anything that I have said. Why? Butunukum, their stomachs are haram. Their stomachs are filled with haram. Does that mean that they were eating like food that was not slaughtered according to Islamic Sharia? Ah? No. Everyone by that time was Muslim. There were so many Muslims in there, everyone was predominantly Muslim. But the mal. But the income that they had received was haram. Was forbidden income. And that has an Im impact on the stomach. It goes through the stomach and it goes to the heart. Because it turns the heart hard. And once the heart is, heart is hard, it's very difficult to return back from that. And we see examples of this every day for people who know and see the signs. You can see and you question certain people you, that they're stone cold. Mm. They've got no passion. Mm. Even, for example, um, uh, when you do amal, mm. uh, when you attend the Husseiniyah, uh, you may see people who have find it very difficult to connect. Very, and you always, we should question because it's, it's important that it's not just what we do. It's also, as you said, the means we earn that income eventually will have an effect if the, if the, if the um, sustenance that I've earned is haram. Mm. Anything I use, mm. anything I want to purchase or use it with, automatically it will affect it. Mm. So my entire surrounding, like the clothes I wear is impure, the food I eat will be impure, uh, my surrounding, my entire background will be impure. So that will have that negative effect and eventually I'll be so deep into it, I won't even realize. Absolutely. It's like being a zombie or something. Absolutely. Now, so with respect to that, a very good point. At some point in time, we may begin, if we are not concerned about the income that is coming into our homes, then we may get down to the slippery slope of we may, get, we may say wealth by any means necessary. We're trying to lay the foundation, make that clear, that's not the Islamic premise. That I cannot just say that, for example, I will earn income by any means necessary and then I'll give some, for example, some charity at the end of the year. That's not sufficient. That's not how it works. Because that means of earning sustenance in the wrong manner, it can have an impact on who you become and who you are. And it's a big check of your integrity. It's a very difficult test. Because if you know you can make hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars by swindling or misdirecting people, you know, it's, it's, it's very, it's very, it, that calls you to check yourself every single day. And it's a tough task. It's tough. But perhaps why? that's why there is also falila in that as well. That you are able to, to navigate that terrain and still give back. We need people to be enterprising, we need people to be successful, we need people to work hard. But work hard the way the Ahlul Bayt salam did, not the way we want to. It's very important to do that. Inshallah, we'll, we'll elaborate on this. Inshallah. inshallah. Now, <clears throat> we'd like to pause for a short break. And as um, soon as we're back, we'll continue. Inshallah, stay with us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back, uh, my beloved brothers and sisters, respected viewers. You are watching us live on Imam Hussein TV. Um, this is T3, Teach, Talk, and Thrive. Uh, inshallah, we've uh, entered the second half of the show where the lines are now open for any of you who'd like to join our conversation or have any questions. Um, the phone number is 0203-515-0199. I repeat, 0203-515-0199. Um, uh, inshallah, we'll be looking forward um, for your phone calls. In the meanwhile, um, Sayyidna, you were talking about a very beautiful story regarding a brother from Iraq who mm. came to Europe. 
Yes, absolutely. So I was mentioning that he he had come from Iraq. He had got his first job in Europe, and he was a, basically a chief negotiator for procurement to get uh, goods. And so he wanted to do better than anyone else. So he would negotiate to the point that he would get a very good deal for his company, but maybe not the best deal for the other party. So time went on. He said one day his boss or his employer called him into the office, and this was. He called him in the office, you know, he maybe he's expecting a promotion or doing something better. And he sat down and he said that, you know, I'm sorry, but I have to let you go. I had to lay him off. I had to fire him. This is not necessarily the conversation anyone wants to hear. And he said that, you know, he said, okay, no problem. Just tell me why. I just want to know why. Mm. And he said that, you know, because your business is thriving, so there's no shortage of funds. You have funding. There's not, that's not a problem. And I, in terms of my work, you know better than me that I do better job than anyone else here in my job. Like I'm very, very committed to it, and I get the best results for you. He said that's true. He said both of what you have said is true. He said, however, there's something that you're missing that's very important to me. The the owner said. He said, what's that? He said, I want you to know, and I think you may be aware, but this is how I see it. The owner says. He says, all of my suppliers, you do very good deals with them, for us at least. You negotiate very well, maybe they don't do as well, but we do very well. But there's one very important thing that you're missing, and that is that when you do these deals with them, all of my suppliers are from my community. And when you negotiate so hard with them, you weaken my community. And he said, I can't have that. Allah. This was a man who was not a Muslim, by the way. He said that I have a community and you are undercutting my own community. I can't tolerate that. I can't stand that. I'm sorry I have to let you go. Imagine to shift one's thinking from individual to communal, to community. Mm. Benefit of the whole. The benefit of the whole. So this is a very important component to what you said. Until and unless we develop this mindset that it's not just about me and my immediate family, it's about my whole community. That how can I build an enterprise where I'm employing others and I'm supporting others, my suppliers are from my community, my society, and I'm giving back to my world, my community, in my own space, in my own capacity. You talked about negotiating. And negotiating, I met one of the top negotiators in Europe just a few weeks ago of one of the big companies like the IBM Cisco's. And he was the top negotiator. We're at a conference, and I said to him that, you know, wow, top negotiator. You know, I negotiate quite a bit myself, but you're the top guy for a Fortune 500 company. Let me ask you, you know, and he was an older gentleman. So, what's the most important aspect of negotiations? What's the most? What, what have you learned in these 20, 30 years? You want to share that? He's like, he said one word. He looked in, leaned at me, and he looked at me and said, "Listen." That's the most important thing in, in negotiations. Just listen to what the other side wants. When, how can you do fair and equitable negotiations? It's by understanding the whole pie, by understanding everything. Mm -hmm. What the other person wants and needs, what you want and need. And trying to create a win-win scenario for both parties. When you create win-wins for yourself and for the other party, you will not have to go looking for business. Business will come to you. Is it always possible to create win-win situations? It's a challenge. It can require some more thinking and it can require some more listening. Mm. But in the long run, it will pay dividends. There's very famous books like this. For example, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It talks about, about Stephen Covey. He talks about creating win-win scenarios. These are the habits of highly effective people in the world. They create win-wins. And I'm very confident that that's what Rasulullah was doing when he was doing business. That is what Lady Khadija was doing when she was doing business. That is what Amir al-Mu'mineen was doing when he was doing business. That was Imam Hassan al-Husayn and all the Ahlul Bayt when they did business. That's how they did business in my mind. They did it by creating win-win scenarios for both parties. So you have to listen. A negotiation, you think of it as a pie. When you and I come, I individually have a smaller pie, you individually have a smaller pie. But when we come together, we can have a larger pie. Now the problem arises when I want a bigger slice than you, and we begin to become greedy. Mm. This is what actually governs, there's two emotions that govern Wall Street, that, or all investments for that matter. Fear and greed. These are the things that actually, I remember one of the, I did an internship, 
uh, when I was young and I had also gone a little bit into investment banking so I was able to understand investments and see if this was for me or not. Um, so internships and also I had some practical exam uh, practice in the field as well working. And in those charts, those graphs that you see in banking and investments and the likes, there's a lot of psychology embedded in, that, in it. In fact, there are certain people who trade and do investments only on the psychology of reading the graph. They said, I don't hear when I need to hear the news. I don't need to listen to MSNBC or CNBC or any of these channels. I don't need to listen to, to Bloomberg or any of these channels. I will just look at the chart and the chart will tell me everything I need to know in terms of how people feel. And so there's psychology embedded in that. The same way, can I control my fear and greed? If you can control it, and you can remove the emotions away from the dealings in your business and make strategic decisions, you can thrive. This is what B Warren Buffett does, for example, by the way. Who? Warren Buffett, the second wealth wealthiest man in the world. You know, him and Bill Gates go back and forth. You know, now it's, of course, Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon, who's the wealthiest man in the world. But these three have always fluctuated back and forth, you know. Um, Warren Buffett. And, of course, it's a man who's very charitable in a lot of sense, like Bill Gates as well. But he and his, his uh, second in command, if you will, Charlie Munger, they're very adamant that you need to remove emotion from the decision and make fair decisions in terms of making, making logical decisions. Most people become very emotional and fearful. Oh, maybe if I, if I lose this deal or if I lose a little bit of profit on this deal, then I, I won't be able to survive or sustain. No, have tawakkul ala Allah, have trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if you do your hard work, you will succeed. You made a very interesting point that I wanted to elaborate on earlier. That looking at it and seeing the signs of, you know, is this for me or is this not? Very important to note that research has found that most entrepreneurs in America, they do not succeed on their first or second endeavor. They succeed on their third or fourth, sometimes even more later after that. If you just listen to a man like Jack, Jack Ma, for example, who is the founder Alibaba. of Alibaba, Ahsan, he talks about how much he failed in life. Mm. He talks about how a KFC or something was opening in China, and he w and twenty something people applied. I think twenty five people applied, and he said twenty four got the job. I didn't get the job. He said everyone else got it. I didn't get it. He talks about how he went to Har he applied to Harvard numerous times, didn't get in, but he had persistence. Someone to succeed needs to have something called per tenacity, this word. Persistence and tenacity combined. Absolute resilience and trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you will get, there's no doubt about it. How do you mitigate this? Someone may say that, well, the first and second time people fail on their first and second business. And they, why is that? Because they learn very valuable lessons in their first and second endeavors. That they apply to the third, fourth and beyond. But the thing is, nobody gets past the first and second endeavor. They give up. That's the problem. So how do you mitigate? You say, you say I'm in my 20s or in my, I'm in my 30s. I don't want to fail on my first and second time. I don't have time for that. How do you do it? You start earlier. Start doing business at a young age. You know, you've heard of children creating lemonade at the lemonade stand in the summer. They sell it, for example. Or someone creating juice. We should encourage this in our youth and our next generation. Start business young, but tell them, encourage, with ethics. Never lie, cheat, or steal, ever. Don't do any of these things. When you want to do business, do it like Ahlul Bayt Ali salam. And so they will learn very valuable lessons in their youth and in their adolescence. So by the time they're 18, 19, 20, they will succeed and they will do phenomenal in that regard. We must encourage that. It's a very important component. That they thrive in that regard. We should not say, we should not look down at a youth or a child who's maybe 15, 16, 17 years old and say, oh, that's just a child doing business. No, we must encourage them and help and support them. Support them through purchasing from them, becoming a customer. Support them through, for example, investing in them and help them thrive. That's how you thrive. If you want to get something in your life, start giving. That's the most important lesson that we can take away today. That if you want to be successful in business, if you want to be successful in life, and I'm someone who's just started on this journey myself. I'm not saying that I'm someone who's thriving in this regard yet. No, I'm on, I'm on the journey just like you and I. I'm on the journey like all of our viewers. We're on this journey together. 
But what I'm saying is in light of the traditions of the Ma'asumin the Ahlul Bayt in light of the practical world, how can we combine that together and get to a better place in our lives? This is how we do it. By actually striving and endeavoring. Allah has already promised, God Almighty has already promised you risk and I risk. Sustenance has been guaranteed. Even that small fish in the ocean is getting its sustenance. I mean, Allah has always kept our sustenance there. The only reason somebody may not have is someone else maybe usurping or taking their right. That's different. That's where the cheating and stealing and integrity comes into play. Which it's abundance in our days, unfortunately. Unfortunately. But how do you thrive? You know, there's numerous research that, that is found. You know, you people want to eliminate, you want to eliminate poverty. You want to reduce the amount of poverty in the world. You don't want to see poor people. What do you do? People give charity. It's good, alhamdulillah. There are many traditions on giving charity. It's a beautiful thing. But is charity itself an effective means to eradicate poverty? No. This is a very important point. Ahsan. Because it's one thing giving someone the fish, but ah. you need to learn him how to fish it. Subhanallah. So it's one thing to give a man a fish for a day, but it's different to teach a man how to fish. Then that person or man or woman, they know how to, for example, over their life, get their own. So there's research that's done, been done by a Nobel laureate, the Nobel Prize winner, Muhammad Yunus from Bangladesh. And he found that charity is not effective to eradicate poverty. Why? Because what happens is charity is not very consistent. I have charity one day, maybe I get some money, $100. Next day, I don't know when it's going to come, how much it's going to come, things like this. I don't know. It's inconsistent. That's not. He said what's much more effective is something called microloans. You give someone just enough money, for example, in order to buy a sewing machine, for example. So they can buy or purchase a sewing machine. If they buy or, sew or purchase, and you teach them how to sew, for example, or maybe they know how to sew. And they're able to sew and tailor garments. When they do this, they're able to sell that, for example, or sell their services, or they're able to sell the products that they produce. And then they are able to re repay you back that loan that you gave them of 500 pounds or 1,000 dollars. And you can invest that to another community. Which Subhanallah. So he said, and what we realized from this lesson is that people do not want charity. They want opportunity. Ahsan. That's what's more valuable. We need to try to help give other people opportunities. So why not get some brothers or sisters together from the community and make a trust, for example, or some charitable investment fund that we will put this money together and we will circulate it and help people start businesses. You know, people think they need a lot of capital to get started. Do you know that most millionaires in America, they started their first business with $5,000 in capital. That's it. $5,000 in capital? I think we could arrange that pretty quickly amongst our community. That would not be a problem. But the thing is, trust and integrity must be maintained on both sides. Those who are putting in the funds, they should not be sharking the others by taking, for example, interest on high exorbitant amounts. And at the same time, <coughs> they should not be taking advantage. And those who take the funds should also be doing justice and help others, inshallah. Ahsan and we hope we succeed through that. Inshallah. inshallah. Um, I'd like to thank you so much, uh, Sayyidina, uh, for sharing uh, your experience and knowledge. Inshallah, dear brothers and sisters, uh, respected viewers, unfortunately, we've run out of time once again. But I truly hope that this uh, program has been as beneficial for yourselves as it has been for us. Please um, join us again next week, Saturday 6.30, inshallah. Uh, until then, coming up, we got Ahkam SOS with uh, Sheikh Ma'ash and Sayyid Mohsin Shah. Jazakumullah khair. Ma'asalam. Mm -hmm.